Okay. Well, um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation to come here. It's a great pleasure to be back to Pisa after some years. And so I will be talking about some high spin issues uh, with some emphasis on the issues related to holography. Uh, well, to begin with, let me just maybe say a few words about the structure of these theories just using the one single slide. Uh, well, uh, most important part of this name is the gauge part, because higher spin gauge symmetries, higher spin gauge theories are theories where some higher symmetries show up. And actually, this is the main issue, because basically the problem is not to describe massless fields that we are hope, there is a hope to, to observe somehow, but the issue is to analyze as symmetric uh, uh, theories that have a large and huge symmetry and to see what is their structure. Well, uh, many years ago it was actually observed that some interactions can be introduced for higher spin fields uh, with these two groups from Sweden and uh, Holland. And these people found some uh, vertices and I think the, the most important message was that higher spin interactions contain higher derivatives. If we consider higher and higher spins, then more and more derivatives appear at the vertices that we already can observe with lower spin fields, like scalar, spinner, and uh, spin one, and so on and so forth. Well, this immediately means that these theories should contain some dimensionful parameter, these vertices. And given that we start with massless fields with no dimensionful parameter, it's tricky to introduce such a theory and to understand where it, where it comes from. So that's why for many years it was difficult to introduce interactions. But at some stage in uh, 87 by Kropkin and myself, we observed that things are getting much more well organized if we start with non-zero curvature and we use the uh, radius of background space as such an expansion parameter, which at least formally. Then one can introduce some interactions. And that was uh, is around for about 25 years. But those days, uh, the, the, the feature that these theories require some non-trivial, non-zero curvatures, and in particular, the sitter or anti de sitter in the most symmetric case was not much appreciated because uh, ADS CFT correspondence came out later on. Uh, nevertheless, actually, there were some uh, um, results by Flat and Franz, though, that are very closely related to the boss issues to higher spin gauge theories and also to ideas CFT. Mathematically, what they have shown, they've shown that if one considers uh, spaces of single particle states of massless fields in three dimensions, which they call photons, and actually Massimo Pareto mentioned this theorem in his talk, then considering a tensor product of this, we get all massless representations in four dimensions. So this are representation with respect to the same group, which is either treated as conformal group in three dimensions or as anti de Sitter in four. Basically, what we see here is just the starting point for ADS CFT, because these are bilinears of massless fields in three dimensions, which are actually currents, and these are massless fields in four dimensions. So this relation actually was known even before these gauge theories were found out. But the spectrum of fields precisely matches the one that was found in those papers. So basically, the relation to ADS-CFT correspondence was inbuilt in this construction. Well, the interest uh, to, to people started to, be, to, to, to discuss what might be a holographically dual model for higher spin gauge theories after this paper by Sandberg. And then people discussed this a lot, and this is not the full list of uh, people who contributed. But I think that the most uh, important uh, contribution and suggestion was due to Klebanov and Polikov, who suggested that the higher spin gauge theory in uh, four dimensions should be holographically due to a sigma model in three dimensions, either free or critical. And similar suggestions were given by Sergen and Sandel. So then it took uh, a while before actually this conjecture was checked explicitly by comparing, by computing three-point uh, correlators in the boundary theory by John B. Nin, 
And they uh, managed to show that there is a correspondence indeed. So they confirmed this uh, conjecture by Klebanov and Polikov. And after that, actually, the activity uh, is very uh, high. And in particular, there were two papers by Malbasin and Jibayedov on the issue where they formulated some kind of uh, well, uh, common mandrel like theorem that states that actually if there are too many symmetries at the boundary, which means some higher spin symmetries, uh, and these are, I will, I will make it more explicit what, what was assumed maybe later on. Then the conclusion was that the corresponding uh, correlators should all correspond to a free theory. That sometimes is interpreted as higher spin gauge theory in four dimensions is due to free theory in three dimensions. Well, um, actually, this uh, comment actually uh, raised the question of directly what is a dual of uh, ADS for theory. And this is the issue of my talk, because I will try to explain how one can directly see what uh, to play this to two types of theories. And moreover, actually, how we can, uh, in very general terms, raise the question of a class of holographically dual theories in general using the machinery that was elaborated when working with these theories. We will see that actually this theorem is perfectly correct in the cases where the conditions of the theorem are respected, but there are many cases where they are respected and then the conclusion is wrong. So that uh, is not correct, but it should not be correct in that case. So there are different phases of higher spin gauge theories. Some correspond to free fields, some don't. All right. So let me just summarize results of this talk. And uh, in case I will not be able to, to come to the end. So there are two, basically, two main results. Well, the one result is that for the generic case in the space of parameters, I will make it, try to make it more clear later on, uh, three-dimensional dual of the four-dimensional higher spin theory is actually a theory which is again a higher spin theory of three-dimensional conformal higher spin fields. And as such, this is a three-dimensional gravitational theory. Well, the cases where uh, it comes to be due to free fields are very specific cases in the spaces of parameter. And another issue is that holography can be, I think, very clearly understood in terms of what I call unfolding machinery. This is a specific description of dynamical system. And this is the point from where I, I will try to start. So that's probably is a tool to understand the uh, classes of holographically equivalent theories. So after discussing the, this a little bit in detail, I will come to examples related to particular model I want to consider. These are free massless higher spin fields in ADS4. Then I will discuss their duals, which are conserved currents in three dimensions. And then uh, we will interpret the four-dimensional higher spin theory directly as a three-dimensional conformal theory. Well, this consideration uh, will be most the classical level, so it's not at all full analysis. I will not consider correlators in this talk. I just want to say that actually this is possible to do. This work is in progress, and um, I expect that uh, everything will work smoothly. So if I have some time, I will discuss some very different holography and very unexpected one. It turns out that by this means, one can relate relativistic theories in higher dimensions, like three, four, and higher, with some non-relativistic models, which are described by ordinary Schrodinger equation. This is very unexpected relation, which, however, is really uh, manifest, and one can actually map one description to another. All right. Uh, well, maybe I'll make some couple of comments that I didn't plan and that are not included here, but I, uh, I realized that maybe they are relevant in the context of the last two talks in this session. OK, so what I mean by unfolded dynamics, it's a very simple, uh, actually, uh, concept, a very, very simple uh, approach. Well, first of all, everybody knows that in the theory of ordinary differential equations, it's, uh, it is convenient to uh, rewrite ordinary differential equations in the first order form just by adding more variables here. And this is always, can always be done by simply 
introducing new letters for all those variables that derivatives of variables that are not determined by the differential equation. So it's more or less like introducing a phase space in the Hamiltonian analysis. So okay, we just add more variables and in the end we have this description that's very simple. Uh, but actually it gives us a lot of information because now the uh, dynamics is under better control in particular the freedom are given by this set of variables that we find in this approach. So this is from where uh, we know the phase space and things like this. So the issue is how can we extend this approach to in a covariant way to, to, to preserve not only Lorentz covariance but also coordinate independence if we are thinking in terms of uh, gravity theory. So we want to keep diffeomorphisms. And actually the idea is very straightforward. What we should do, we should use the formalism of differential forms. We should replace time derivative by the exterior differential here and a set of dynamical variables by a set of uh, differential forms. So the idea is to, by introducing more variables, to rewrite the original system in the first order form where exterior differential of every differential form is expressed as a function of the same set of differential forms. So basically this is absolutely the same game. Well, the novelty is that function g cannot be arbitrary in this case because d squares to zero. This means that there are some compatibility conditions and Bianca identity have to be respected. And they impose a condition on the function g. I should emphasize that this is equation on the function g that should hold for arbitrary w. It's, it's just this function should be uh, taken in a very specific form. And this is a kind of generalized Jacobi identity that appears indeed as a Jacobi identity for Lie algebra in the simplest case. Well, um, actually this structure appears in many uh, different corners of uh, theoretical physics and math. It was first introduced in 68 by Sullivan in mathematical context and then later it was rediscovered independently in the context of supergravity by the Auri and Pre in 82. Basically, this is uh, the structure that plays a fundamental role in this description. Well, one immediate consequence is that once these bank identities are satisfied, then actually, as usual, this implies gauge symmetry. So gauge symmetry is inbuilt in this construction automatically. And this is what uh, is the most important part of the story if thinking in terms of gauge symmetry, higher spin gauge symmetry. So if we reformulate our fields, our equations in this form, then gauge symmetries will be manifest immediately. Okay. Uh, well, an example uh, of such a construction is given by the case where all our fields are one forms. Suppose that all fields are one forms. Then actually the best that we can do we can write equation of this type because d of omega is a two form, so two forms should have this form. And there are some coefficients which are structure coefficients encoded by this commutator here. And compatibility just implies that indeed this one form should belong to a Lie algebra. And this is the Maurer Cartan equation for this Lie algebra. Actually, this is not the, just a formal example. This is one of the most important ingredients of the theories because. This is how vacuum geometry appear in this theory. So that's basically vacuum geometry solves some zero coverage equations for zero forms. And depending on the Lie algebra where these one forms are valued, we have one or another symmetry manifestly realized as global symmetry in, in such a system. So this is the way how global symmetries appear in this construction, in a very, very convenient and efficient way. And coordinate independent way, let me emphasize. So there is no you can choose one or another gauge, but it doesn't matter each. All right, so if we want Poincaré, antidecitary, conformal, whatever, we just take these equations for the corresponding Lie algebra, uh, and we start with this as the vacuum uh, fields. Now let me very briefly summarize the properties of this of this formulation. Actually, the least can be extended several times, but uh, uh, it's the, the more we think, the more interesting properties we find. But for us, most important is that number one is that this approach is general. You can reformulate any theory in this way. It's very much the same as any system of ordinary differential equations can be reformulated in the first 
for their form, you can proceed the same way for a generic system here. Uh, now this has a status of some kind of theorem. It's not just uh, uh, exper well, experiment. Well, high spin gauge symmetries are manifest if we are talking about high spin gauge symmetries. Well, <coughs> this approach is coordinate independent, so diffeomorphisms are uh, manifest here, which is very nice um, if thinking in terms of gravity theory. All right. Uh, well, uh, interactions just are parameters that can be introduced into this function g that defines the equation here, such that uh, this compatibility condition is respected. Uh, well, now we're coming to most important issues to, uh, for this talk. So the question is, where are the degrees of freedom in this description? What, where is dynamics? It turns out that very much like in the ordinary differential equation case, degrees of freedom are given by number of cues at a given time, right? Here, degrees of freedom are given by a number, by a set of zero forms. This is because of Poincare lemma, because everything apart from zero forms is locally uh, trivial. If, if it's closed, it's exact. Here, at a given point of space time, at a given x naught, and this is a little bit unusual because we have to fix a set of fields to describe all dynamics. It uh, may sound uh, even impossible if one would think in usual terms where a finite number of fields is involved. But this is actually the point. As in this formulation, you have, one has to introduce an infinite set of fields, which may again be a little bit unusual, but one can very easily realize that the sets of fields that come out from this realization actually are very well known in field theory because the spaces of these fields is nothing else as the spaces of single particle states in the, in, in the field theory. That is essentially the same space up to maybe reality conditions and the norms. So basically, when one reformulates this theory this way, one immediately starts working in terms of spaces of single particle states attached to every point of space time. We'll see examples how it works. In practice, it works very nicely, actually, in particular examples I'm going to tell you about. Well, uh, but once we realize that, we actually can immediately realize what holography is, because the message is that dynamics is determined by values of fields at a given point of space-time. But then it doesn't matter how many dimensions of this space-time is around. We just take a single point, and we have some dynamical system. Then we can rewrite this equation in one dimension or another. I will come back to this issue in a moment. And actually, we'll get completely differently looking systems in different space-time dimensions, which have the same number of degrees of freedom, and actually which are completely equivalent. Let me come to this issue to, to discuss in a little bit more detail. OK. So uh, as I said already, this gives the possibility to relate theories that live in different dimensions. And this is what is most uh, unusual in the holographic duality, that we relate somehow theories that live in space-times with different dimensions. But actually, it's even more. Uh, this unfolded formulation, it allows you to discuss all kinds of duality, not necessarily in different dimensions, but in the same space-time, while usual dualities are, are also inbuilt in this construction. And basically, the uh, criteria is if you unfold one system or another, if you write at the same function g, then this means that these systems are equivalent. OK, so let me now come to the issue of uh, different space-time dimensions. What is the, the, the point? The point is very simple. So suppose we are living in the space-time with coordinates axis. And suppose we extend it to a larger space with additional coordinates dx hat here. So this push forward can be very easily realized by simply adding new components of fields of differential forms along additional directions in a standard way. And by rewriting our equations in this form, where d tilde is this extended differential that acts both on axis and on x hat. So we arrived at these equations instead of those that were, there were no, was no trace of x hat. So the comment number one is that at a given value of x hat, we are getting back to our original system. So our original system is a part of it. 
But what about the other equations that determine evolution along x hat? Well, they just determine the values of our fields in terms of initial data at a given x hat. So basically, this is the same dynamical system. Well, um, <clears throat> the other question is how the differential equations look like in terms of one or, or another space-time variables. They, they may look completely different. I will come back, I will show this with the examples later on. But basically, they look differently because you, one starts with different number of coordinates and different background connections, but they still describe the same dynamics. And I believe that this is the origin of holographic duality between uh, different theories. And actually, it goes far away because one can compute invariance in a way that is insensitive to uh, particular choice of coordinates. And this invariance may describe either actions or generating functions for correlators, depending on the interpretation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'm going to tell, tell about this. And actually, the issue is that, indeed, this description goes beyond 1 over n expansion. And actually, that makes it possible to establish holographic duality between theories beyond this 1 over n expansion. But then the boundary theory becomes theory of gravity. Actually, that uh, is different. So this is a kind of extension. And uh, when, when this 1 over n parameter can be identified with the gravitational constant of the boundary theory, if you like. And at the same time, if, if you raise this question, this is why the Modesino, one of the reasons why the Modesino-Gebedev theorem is avoided, because actually this is not the normal conformal theory at the boundary. That's uh, in most cases. I'll, I'll show this with the, in, in examples. All right. So if it's true, then actually we can, well, should be able to just uh, give a criteria that classifies different equivalence classes with respect to holographic duality. And this goes far beyond uh, duality between models in D plus 1 and D. In particular, what I'm arguing is that there is a duality between models in uh, some D dimension, or D plus 1 dimension, and 0 dimension, for example. And this would be very much reminiscent of matrix models. I think this is a kind of a matrix model realization here. And I will show some different examples later. OK, so let me come now to some details. Uh, well, I, I would like to remind you a little bit about free massless fields in ADS4. Uh, well, I showed this formula just uh, to make the discussion explicit. I don't expect that you will be able to trace about all indices here, but let me just explain the, the structure. So. In four dimensions, to describe a set of all massless fields together, and this is the set that uh, appears in the framework of highest gauge theories, one should introduce uh, two sets of generating two generating functions for one forms. This is omega, and for c forms, this is c. Uh, for zero forms, this is c. And for some reason, there is a doubling that is convenient to introduce. Let me skip explanation why. When fermions are around, it should necessarily be there. Well, OK, so we have some reality condition. And actually, uh, these additional variables, y, they carry spinner indices. And these are uh, auxiliary bosonic spinners, so that they commute to, to 0. And then we can expand in powers of y. And these give us a tower of fields with arbitrary integer, arbitrary non-negative integers n and n. So this is the generating function for either highest gauge fields or uh, matter fields sitting in these zero forms, as well as invariant tensors of, of highest gauge fields. Well, and in this way, one can very concisely write down this unfolded form for all these free massless fields. So basically, this is the curvature. Here it's an explicit form, which is a very simple differential operator acting in terms of y's. So the Lorentz derivative is given by this expression. So that's a very simple expression. This is indeed the linearized highest curvature that can, starts with uh, spin 1 Maxwell tensor, 
uh, Riemann tensor and in Cartan formulation and so on and so forth. Well, the right hand side, side tell us which components of the curvatures uh, can be non-zero on shell. Well, for example, in the spin one case, actually these give you all components. Spin one case is the case where uh, the, there is no dependence on y and y bar because uh, the corresponding uh, potential is just the one form. There are no additional indices. All right, so that's uh, for spin two, this is, starts with the wild tensor, and this is, goes the same way for higher spin fields. And also one has some covariant constants equation on the uh, wild tensors, their first derivative, second derivative, so on and so forth. And altogether, at a given point of x, at a given point x, this set contains all on shell non trivial components, say, um, of Maxwell tensor in one case, or wild tensor in spin two case, and so on and so forth. And now it's not that, should not be that surprising that given this set of data, we can reconstruct solution starting from a given point because we simply know all derivatives of our fields around the given point. So we can reconstruct at least in some neighborhood. So this is how these unfolded equations are formulated at the free field level in the four dimensional case. Okay. So the next issue, of course, is how to go beyond the free field limit. To this end, one should replace this equation by some nonlinear equations. And there are two uh, places where this nonlinearity show up. One is that the originally linearized curvature should become non-abelian. So we have to introduce some non-abelian structure, which is a higher spin algebra. It just generalizes young mills and generalizes anti Sitter algebra to higher spins. And number two, we should somehow take care of these terms. And this is actually the most uh, difficult part of the story, to, to find how one can find full consistent equations that at the linearized level will reproduce this. I will not uh, uh, discuss in this talk exact structure of full equations because I will not need it. Um, well, actually, these days it's um, rather well known, but in this talk I will not, uh, to, because of lack of time, I will not discuss it. But let me just mention what is the higher spin algebra that appears. So this is a non abelian algebra, and it has a very simple realization in terms of star product algebra, which is essentially the algebra of quantum operators of some quantum mechanics of a finite number of degrees of freedom. So basically, one introduces oscillators, Ya and Yb, that commute to a constant matrix. And this constant matrix, by the way, has a very uh, clear physical meaning in four dimensions, because this is actually the charge conjugation matrix, which is anti-symmetric in four dimensions. So this is why this construction is manifestly Lorentz covariant, which is very different from what is known from uh, uh, non commutative geometry when the matrix that appears on the right hand side is anti symmetric space time tensor, which is, cannot be Lorentz invariant. So, this is a Lorentz covariant construction, and here is uh, the formula which is integral version of the Mayall star product for the function of oscillators. So, basically, the non abelian curvatures result from the linearized by adding these star product terms here. They reproduce the linearized curvatures at the linearized level, plus all non-abelian corrections. And one can proceed similarly with the covariant derivative acting on the, zero, on the zero forms. There is a little difference because there is some sign change, which uh, means that the corresponding representation is not adjoint. It's called twisted adjoint, but let me skip details, even though it's a very important point of the analysis. So basically, what I would like to say is that uh, in the bulk side, well, the deformation to interactions is given by this star product plus many more, more terms that I will not discuss today. All right. Um, now let me come to the three-dimensional part of the story. So let me discuss conserved currents. And again, I will start with uh, unfolded formulation for uh, conformal, free conformal field at the boundary. And these are scalar and spinner. And again, they are described by a zero form C that depends on the auxiliary variables Y. But now these Ys are 
spinners in two plus one dimensions. So these are two component spinners. And I claim that usual klein gordon equation and Dirac equation for with the zero rest mass, uh, if unfolded, they have this form. They can be given to this form. In particular, I can check that every solution of this equation satisfies Dirac and satisfies klein gordon OK. So these are free fields. Um, then the next step is that one can consider what is, uh, we call high rank fields here, which means that we can consider a number of oscillators. We can consider some number greater than one. For example, two is called rank here. And considering these unfolded equations of this, type, of this form. Well, from this construction, it's actually uh, one thing that is immediately obvious is that uh, uh, given a set of solutions of rank one system, which means given a set of free fields, one can immediately find a solution of rank R equation, which is a, just a product of this form. And in particular, one can do this for the case of R equal two, and this is the case where conserved currents come in, into the game. Actually, rank two equations describe precisely conserved currents in two plus one dimension. You can see that uh, these equations have a consequence conservation condition. I'll show this in a little bit in more detail. And what is given here is that conserved currents in two plus one dimensions are given by bilinears of these uh, rank one fields, of massless fields in unfolded form. Let me uh, emphasize something that actually this is very close to uh, what was considered, Yasin considered in his talk, because this is like bilinear, uh, bilocal uh, form for conserved currents, but in different fashion, because here you see there is no bilocality with respect to x's, but there is a bilocality with respect to y's. So in some sense, these are fields which are bilocal in the twister space, but not in space-time. That makes a lot of difference, because one should not impose any further conditions on, this, on these fields, they conserve just as bilinear, as free functions. They become conserved currents. So if one considers conformal field theory in terms of these objects, then one can one solves already all the conservation conditions in this. So that is actually a very con convenient tool for analyzing uh, correlators in particular. All right. Uh, so looking at this unfolded equation, one have, have to figure out what are independent fields here, like scalar and spinner in the case of massless fields, and what are uh, their derivatives, the sentences. Well, this is easily, can easily be done, and the result is as follows. There are two sets of genuine conserved currents that really correspond to original conserved currents, not their derivatives, given by these generating functions, plus one additional guy, which is a scalar uh, current, if you like. So one can compute easily conformal dimensions arriving at the, these results, which are correct results for uh, twist two operators in three dimensions. So all these currents have the dimension, conformal dimension related to their spin, plus this distinguished object has uh, dimension two, conformal dimension two, and actually the spin zero member of this set and this guy precisely give us the two possible conformal fields in the three-dimensional case. So this unfolded machinery just reproduces all possible uh, currents that can be shown up, can be expected. Well, also one can derive from unfolded equations the following consequences, which are just the conservation conditions. There's nothing else, because it tells us that derivative with respect to x contracting indices with indices which are carried by variables u give zero, which means just conservation conditions. So d, a, d, d uh, x, a, j, a is zero. So these are indeed conserved currents. Well, OK, so we know both sides. Let us try to relate them. So let us now consider uh, uh, Harrison theory in four dimensions and interpret it as a conformal theory in three dimensions. Let's see what, we'll, what we will get. Um, well, uh, to this end, as usual, one should introduce conformal basis. One should introduce 
uh, basis where generators of anti-de-Sitter algebra can be interpreted as generators of three-dimensional conformal symmetry. So this is Lorentz generators, dilatations, uh, translations, and special conformal. And then one can see that uh, actually the uh, connections uh, acquire appropriate conformal dimensions. Let me skip this. And one can pursue different way, but the simplest option is to do as what people are usually doing is to go to infinity by introducing Poincaré coordinates. So this is how the Poincaré coordinates can be introduced in these terms. So z is the Poincaré coordinates so that the conformal infinity is at z equals zero. Uh, and this is the set of uh, Pilbein and Lorentz connection in these coordinates. So we simply rewrite our four-dimensional equations in this form and then observe that by a simple filter definition that includes only two true well, elementary actions like the scaling of our variables y and like uh, some prefactor here, well, this equation just give us equation of this form with this 10, ten okay. Uh, <laughs> no, it just was not clearly written. I mean, it, it, it was not <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so we arrive at this equation as a simple uh, change by, by virtue of simple change of variables. And now we see that this is precisely the unfolded form for three-dimensional conformed currents. It's just current conservation condition upon this. All right. So what about connections? We should do something similar with connections. And here there is one but 100% important difference. Again, using some rescaling of these variables, we can get rid of the uh, Poincaré coordinate z. But here the rescaling goes in opposite way for two uh, these y plus and y minus. So upon this rescaling, we arrive at some equations for uh, one forms. And in the end of the day, we get the unfolded equations in three dimensions inherited from the four-dimensional theory. And they have, at the linearized level, they have this form. So this was so far linearized analysis. So what is important is that there is a right-hand side for the zero for the curvature. And here is expression for these currents in terms of elementary currents, or for the source in terms of elementary currents of the three-dimensional system. And this is actually a kind of surprising uh, point, because uh, <coughs> as a result of that, uh, we can see immediately that if this guy is non-zero, then the boundary theory has no chance to be free. And this is because uh, non-abelian structure that should also be inherited from the boundary side, from the uh, box side, becomes 100% non-abelian. Why? Because remember, rescaling on V and W in terms of Z was opposite which means that the commutation relations remain the same. They just are insensitive to Z, which means that the whole algebra remains the same, which means that the full non-abelian curvature becomes, uh, full curvature remains non-abelian at the, at the boundary. And now, and the same happens to the uh, charge conjugation con condition, which means that instead of usual charge conservation, we get covariant charge conser conservation, which is not the standard, which is be goes beyond the conditions of Maldacin and Jibayelit, gener generally. All right. Uh, well, uh, now important issue, whether or not we can actually uh, get rid of this source. Well, there are two cases where one can indeed get, uh, get rid of this source, and these are precisely the cases that correspond to so-called A and B model in higher spin theory. And this is the issue about the parameter that I have introduced but didn't mention. Uh, there is this parameter uh, eta here. Well, excuse me. Uh, actually here. And depending on whether it's equal to 1 or i, there are two models that behave differently. And these are the A and B models, where one can impose boundary condition, essentially, such that this tensor vanishes. Because so far, I didn't impose any boundary conditions. We had doubled number of currents 
to what people consider in a standard framework where some Dirichlet or Neumann conditions are imposed. So in this case, we indeed can consistently impose this condition. And indeed, in these cases, the uh, theory, boundary theory remains free. And the conditions of the Moldesian uh, Gibelov theorem are respected. And of course, the theorem is correct. But in all other cases, actually, the boundary theory becomes the full uh, uh, conformal uh, three-dimensional higher spin theory with the symmetry algebra introduced by Frotkin and Lenetsky many years ago. Actually, they were considering what might be the conformal higher spin gravity in three dimensions. So this is precisely what appears in this construction. OK. Uh, uh, OK, so now let me uh, say a couple of words about, uh, so, so I, I basically finished with this consideration of ADS4 CFT3. If there are any questions, maybe it's the right time to ask. If not, let me make a couple of questions about very different drugs, which is unexpected, I think. Uh, people actually found it. But here, I would like to give, it inter to give interpretation in terms of this unfolded dynamics. So as I have seen, um, conformal equations for relativistic particles in different dimensions may be given in this form. And here, let me allow the indices A and B that so far took only two values to take an arbitrary number of values for a moment. Well, this system has large symmetry, which is SP2M, because generators can be given by these bilinears. And now what I would like to, say, uh, to, to make, I would like to reduce this symmetry, uh, this theory, to the case where there is only one uh, coordinate x, which I would identify with the time coordinates according to this rule. If I do that, then actually the equations, the pullback of this equation to this single coordinate take this form, which can be easily recognized as a Schrodinger equation, actually, for, for a free particle. So what we find is that, surprisingly, the relativistic system in uh, higher dimensions is the same as non-relativistic system. But identification of coordinates is very uh, unexpected, because non-relativistic coordinates are not related to the coordinates axis here. They are, they are related to twister variables y. Well. This goes actually very far away. One, go, one can analyze symmetries, and one finds that indeed both of these theory, theories have the same symmetries, and these symmetries are pretty large, actually infinite dimensional. These are star product algebras that we have found already, and this is an infinite dimensional symmetry of the free Schrodinger equation. Uh, one can actually uh, compute even uh, physically ob observables like conserved currents. Uh, conserved currents in the higher spin gauge theory in higher dimensions turns out to be related to conserved currents in the Schrinder system. For example, the uh, probability conservation is nothing else as the charge conjugation in the dual theory, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, then one can. Uh, yeah, but you. Yeah. Let me uh, finish with this slide, and then I will come to this, uh, 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 answer this question. Uh, well, one can uh, consider some uh, geometries in the higher spin theories, like De Sitter and anti De Sitter, to see what they are, are their duals in this non-relativistic theory. And the result is that, actually, it is harmonic potential. But in the case of anti De Sitter, this is a normal harmonic potential. In the case of the Sitter, it's just inverted harmonic potential, which is very much in spirit of inflation, I think. Now, let me uh, try to answer. Well, actually, I'm coming to conclusions. Uh, well, uh, first, let me uh, uh, answer Augusta's question. Well, they are equivalent in the sense that one can compute um, observables in these theories, and they are given by the same list. What is very interesting in these higher spin theories is that, for example, conserved charges or actions or invariants like this, they can be given by some integrals of some closed forms in the what is called in twister theory correspondence space, which means x comma y in these terms. Uh, 
Yeah, but yes, exactly. So if I write integral, but even including the cons 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 con these conserved charges, this is a very important issue because you can, instead of integrating as usually people do in ADS CFT correspondence over going inside the bulk, what you can do, you can go inside the twister space and get the same results, which is much simpler, by the way. But if you go to the twister space, your integrals will be become precisely the integrals that you arrive at the quantum mechanics. So in that sense, these theories are equivalent. But of course, interpretation, and this is the issue what you should call by local coordinates, actually. What, what is the meaning of local coordinates in this uh, setup? And this is a physical question. Then you should address the question, actually, what do you observe by the means that you have at your hands? This, this is actually the issue. Theories are equivalent, but then you should analyze what you really see by those means that you have at, uh, at your disposal. Th that is, uh, well, the point. So let me conclude. Well, I believe that, uh, indeed, that uh, holographic duality generally relates theories that have equivalent unfolded formulation because this formulation is insensitive, at least locally, to space-time dimension. Well, as I said, four-dimensional higher spin theory is dual to three-dimensional conformal higher spin theory that describes interactions of higher spin currents and uh, this consideration is actually beyond uh, 1 over n expansion. One can see that 1 over n parameter can be identified with the coupling constant of the boundary gravitational theory. So if you take n to infinity, this interaction go, go away. But if you want to, to, to consider corrections, then one should probably take into account these um, uh, corrections in the general case. Which means that the conjecture is a little bit different from Klebanov and Potov, by the way for at least in the case of critical model, because I'm not sure that these corrections are in their proposal. But it would be very interesting to see how they work. Well, uh, there are indeed three theories that they belong to the class where there are no sources for the higher spin gravitation or higher spin conformal fields. So, okay, so there is a lot of things to do. Uh, uh, in fact, this three-dimensional conformal higher spin theory is not known in the closed form so far, so it's probably a good uh, moment to, to analyze this issue, and also the issue of actions, and of course correlators. As I said, so far I considered classical model. Uh, I'm just claiming this is work in progress, that one can extend it to the level of correlators and really compare commutators, but this uh, I, I, I'm not prepared to tell about right now. And also there is a very interesting issue about the similar interpretation for the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence proposed by Gabardil and Gopakumar. And uh, well, schematically, it, 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 it is going to work very well. I must say that this analysis, uh, because three dimensional Harrison theory is simpler than the four dimensional model, the analysis is harder because uh, the non trivial effects appear not from the first order but from the, sec from the second order. That makes actually things more difficult, difficult, difficult but I, I, I believe that uh, this is also going to work. Thank you very much. The, the discussion was deeply rooted on this uh, twist of construction yeah. for the four dimensional theory that uh, goes down to three dimensions throwing away, so to speak, one of the twisters. Have you thought about what could happen trying to push it up when this correspondence with crystals doesn't hold, but you have uh, bosonic oscillators, so whether somehow, in a sense, it would seem that the argument should go through. And, uh, well, thanks, that's a good question. Well, uh, basically, all this unfolded machinery is a kind of generalized Penrose transform, if, if you like. I mean, these equations map one space to another and just allow you to reproduce solutions in given functions in Y space. What happens if you beyond this standard twister dimensions, what happens is that the twister space is not um, a space of uh, unrestricted functions anymore. These functions have to satisfy additional conditions, which in many cases are as complicated as differential equations in the space time. But generally, the construction as it is, it ex can be extended to this case. But simply, the practical things get a lot more complicated. Uh, okay. If I understood you correctly, you were saying that this would also work at finite n, but 
all your discussion is purely classical, isn't it? So, you're so far, yes. Are you thinking of, for it to work at finite end, that you would have to turn it into some quantum description? Central charge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it really requires going to the quantum I description. I, I, I hope so, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I think so. No, but I hope. <laughs> well, there is something that I don't understand about this. Uh, three-dimensional conformal high-spin theories. Forget about interactions or not interaction. If uh, you have a global O3-2 group right, in your theory, then you can classify your states in terms of representations yes. of O3-2. Now, the representation of dimension S and uh, dimension S plus one and spin S, the one that is the massless field in the bulk, has has to be a concert current because yeah. otherwise there are not enough uh, uh, de yeah. degrees of freedom. So yeah. in that case, uh, you have concert currents and then you can apply the machinery of uh, Maldacena and uh, collaborators that does not depend on where these currents come from. Right, well, this is the, okay. So that's actually, uh, I, I was mentioning some unfinished work that is work in progress. That is one of the issues that this machinery allows you to solve immediately all conservation condition in this, in this setup. And the rest of the problem, how can you play with the operator expansion algebra with these fields, with this set of fields? And for example, what one can do, one can start with free fields where quantization condition we know very well, and just apply them to see how the free theory is reproduced. This is a simp simple part of the story. But the non-trivial part of the story, whether or not you can deform this quantization condition somehow. And probably according to Moldesin and Jibayadov, there is no way. So there's just a single algebra that uh, is around. So you, you, may, you may try to introduce some non-trivial, well, vertex operator algebra if you like, but maybe you will not be able to go beyond three fields. So that's, if I answer the question. Other questions? of Schrodinger type model and um, the ADS model you have smells a little bit like the kind of things it's like Bas writes down. He has these lists of models which are true. Also when he does field theories in his two time approach he also has these infinite towers of fields which look a little bit like unfolding. Do you want to comment on any possible relationship? Well uh uh, well, the, the, there is a relation. Actually, I talked to, to Itzkak many times, and uh, this, most of this work was actually in parallel time. And some, well, I, I, I don't want to discuss this issue, but uh, the point is that, um, well, um, it is useful to introduce manifest conformal symmetry. This is what Itzkak is doing after Dirac and many others, actually. Uh, in that sense, uh, this really uh, is useful indeed. What happens here, by introducing these additional variables, I have much larger symmetry manifest that I don't think Itzkak was considering at all. So th this is the issue. So that's, and I don't think that he uses the, any uh, version of unfolding machinery because, uh, well, this introduction of all these additional modes that describe, if you like, single particle states in the, in the theory actually is not uh, in his approach, I think. Well, as well as actually differential forms. That's basically what, uh, in most cases, with this approach, this happens, people consider zero form sector, if you like, which is very restrictive. Okay, I think that we should thank Mission.